Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. I am so excited to be here um, with you. I love to share the word, but this church has a special place in my heart. I, it's not that I've been here before, but we've got a lot of Valley Forge alums. Uh, Aaron and Jen Kuhn and I went to school together, and then later I taught their daughter, Chloe. I hope I get to see Chloe sometime today. And Tim and Aria and O.C. Oh, there you are, Chloe. Oh, if, if I had time, I'd be like, come up and have a hug, but we'll catch up. Um, and also, Sister Angela has just been a blessing in my life over the years. Your whole pastoral staff, truly. Can we give them one more round of applause? So I'm excited to be here on a day to, that you're honoring your pastors. I see you over there, Aaron, too. Uh, it's so good to, to be able to come and to share an encouraging word that is also, it's for the pastors, but it's also for us as a, as a congregation. And, um, you know, none of your pastors have asked me to come here and, like, pat them on the back publicly, right? But I, I do want to say that pastoring is not for the faint of heart. You get your heart broken a lot when your heart is soft before the Lord, and your pastors are pouring out um, all the time. And so I encourage you to pray for them, and as they are doing the Lord's work, that God would just encourage their hearts as well as they bless you. So this morning, I'm going to spend some time with you in Luke chapter 22. And for a lot of us, it's a little bit of a familiar passage. In the beginning, it starts off with Judas planning on um, scheming to betray Jesus. Then it shifts to the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, where he breaks the bread and brings the cup and says, this is going to be me pretty soon. He tells Peter that he's going to deny him, and at the end, we see that Jesus is praying in the garden that the cup would pass from him, and he's going through that night of agony by himself, and we see then at the, as the chapter kind of closes, the men are coming to seize Jesus to take him to Calvary. And so, in the middle of this passage, there's a little window that we might miss if we go too fast past it. Peter is being told a special message from Jesus in a, just a little, little snippet where Jesus is saying, something is coming and I want to prepare you prophetically for a hardship that's about to come. And so we may be familiar with the story, but I hope today that we can see in Jesus' message to Peter that he's got a message for us too. So let's read this passage beginning um, in verse 31 of Luke 22. Luke 22, 31. And here we see he switches his name to Simon, but this is, this is still Peter. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers and sisters. And two more verses for a little context. And Peter replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you even knew me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask now that your Holy Spirit would come and take this word and apply it to our hearts. Lord, we might not know um, what brought us to this service or why we are here today, but Lord, I believe it's because you are a speaking God who loves to speak to his people. So Lord, would you open up our hearts? Would you make them soft before you? Would you make our hearts the soil that can receive your word today? In Jesus' name, amen. So we see there in the middle of Luke 22 in our passage, there's this moment, this personal moment where Peter and Jesus have a conversation and Jesus wants to let him know it's about to get a little bit rough. Don't you love a heads up sometimes? And so um, as Jesus is speaking here, he wants to tell this precious man upon whom he's going to build his church, I need to prepare you for what is coming. And Peter hears it and goes right past it. He doesn't say, wait, what was that about a devil sifting me? Can you explain a little bit more, like how long is the sifting going to last? How bad will it be? He doesn't go there. He actually jumps right past it and says, Jesus, I'll die for you. I'll go to prison for you. And he's got kind of this dramatic edge to him and maybe a little bit of, of some pride or some arrogance or just a lot of enthusiasm that's unbridled. And Jesus is like, hang on. 
I don't want you to miss this message. And I feel for some of us, we can miss it too. I love Peter's exuberance in, in being kind of the, the hero in the story, right? Jesus, you're going to go through a lot, but don't worry, Jesus, I got your back. <laughs> I'm glad Jesus has my back and not the other way around. But um, it always reminds me of, of Peter kind of putting himself in the center of the story. It reminds me of a time years ago when I was at Regent University. And uh, so I used to drive through this area all the time. I told the morning uh, service that I would stop off at the Ollie's here to buy some cheap books and to use the restroom on my drive. It's like kind of a halfway point. And while I was at Regent, one of the highlights of my work there was to um, set up workshops for local military chaplains. And one of the biggest blessings was that a retired, the retired Navy chief of chaplains, so the head guy, he, would, he was retired and he would come and share Christian leadership lessons and I would organize those moments. Now, when I say that this guy was powerful, he was powerful. He was in charge during 9-11 and he was in the Pentagon at his office when one of the planes hit. And he said that night, he wrote a memo to Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, and said, sir, your Navy is ready. That's all it said. And he said, we're ready to go. So he's a powerful man with powerful connections. And one day after he had spoken um, at an event, I left work and I, I went to the gym and I'm always very careful to be honest that it was not like a heavy lifting gym. It was 20 years ago and it was one of those women's 30 minute fitness where you just go like this while the drums are like dzz, 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 dzz. And they're like, well, it's gonna be sore in the morning and you get the smoothie you know, afterwards to cool off and you, it's more calories than what you burned in that little workout. But I left the gym and I got to the car and there was a message on my cell phone from a number I didn't know and I, I listened to the voicemail and it was Admiral Clark. And he said, Melissa, I have left my thumb drive, my, his little USB port that he puts into the computer with his document. I left the thumb drive in the classroom today. You need to secure this for me. He was asking me as an administrative person to do an administrative task. What this girl heard? Espionage. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what's on this, but I know it is vital, right, for, for our nation's security. And so I get in my car and I rush back to the university. I'm running through the lobby, through these marble halls to get there so that no one else gets this. I can hear the Mission Impossible dun 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 in my head as I'm running and I get it. And I'm, as I'm running out to my car, I'm calling him and I'm like, sir, I have secured the document, right? And the microchip is in my possession. And he didn't pick, well, he did pick up, but he said, I'm, I'm already flying out of town, so uh, I'm up, up in the air, just bring it on Monday. So Monday morning comes, and he's talking to a group of people, and he sees me, and he just motions like, hey, I, I'll take it now. And that just felt very unceremonious to me for after something so huge. <laughs> and so I kind of pulled it back a little bit, and he turned and looked at me, and he said, yes. And I said, sir, this is probably very innocent, like, it's your Christmas card list, your grocery list, you know, your, just your lecture notes. I said, but as far as I'm concerned, these are national secrets and national security. This is the closest to being a spy I will ever become. I can't just hand this over to you like that. And I loved, he turned to me and, he's <clears throat> and he put out two hands to receive it. And he said, Melissa, a grateful nation salutes you. <laughs> love that. Every time, I just, I love how kind he was, and I just am horrified with how foolish I was by putting myself in the center of a story that I did not belong in. I was not the hero. We're not sitting here today under, you know, security because I brought that. But Peter is having one of those moments. Jesus said it's about to get really hard. The enemy wants to sift you like wheat. And he's like, Jesus, I'm on it. I got it. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to go to prison for you. I will do anything. We're going to be good, Jesus, because I'm on it. And Jesus is like, back up, Peter. Did you hear what I said? This isn't going to be easy. Jesus knew two things. Number one, he's going to the cross really soon. And that was going to be hard on them. Number two, that Peter was going to blow it and fail. And that was going to be hard on Peter and then he knew a third thing, that when they went out to share the gospel the way that he was going to ask them to do, they were going to be persecuted. 
So in this moment that he's got alone with someone that he loves and someone that he wants to make sure is gonna be there with him in the ministry, he says, I need to tell you, it's about to get rough and to buckle up. None of us like it when the, um, the pilot of the plane comes on and says, make sure your seatbelts are fastened because it's, a, it's gonna be a little bit turbulent. We don't like that, right? No one's like, yeah, it's awesome. But wouldn't it be worse if all of a sudden the plane drops and, and he came, the pilot comes on the mic and says, wow, we didn't see that coming. I don't know what's next. That would not breed a lot of confidence for us. Jesus is saying, it's gonna get bumpy. And so because I love you, I wanna let you know that. And I wanna prepare your heart for this. Don't run past it. Don't put yourself in the center of the story. It's not about you. I'm gonna work in your life. And we see that here in this passage. So let's look at these two short verses. We're gonna travel through them together. And I hope that you and I will hear a message from the Lord for us. Because if you are a believer, and even if you're not a believer, tough times come, don't they? I was saying this morning uh, in the earlier service that sometimes when those tough times come, we try to pray out of them, but there is like six or seven lined up waiting to take their place. Your transmission blows and you just pay that off and then the refrigerator goes and then there's a medical, but something often just seems like one after the other. And so here's a message from Jesus to Peter and I think it's a message for us today. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. So most of us know what sifting is, right? It's that process where something is shaken, like if you're panning for gold or if you remember the old-fashioned sifters where you'd take the flour and, and the sugar and anything dry ingredients that were clumpy and you shake them over that screen to make sure that, that it can all be sifted nicely and properly. It's a process that also separates what is from what isn't. So you take the wheat and you shake the wheat against a screen and the chaff falls away, the unusable part, and the wheat remains. It's a long and ongoing challenging process. So in the original language of scripture, in the New Testament, it's written in the, the Greek language, and there's a word here for, for sifted. The word is siniadzo. It's only used like twice. It's a very unique word in the, in the New Testament. The first translation of the word means to sift. So it's good, we're, we're right on point with, with how it's translated. But there's another translation for it, another, another meaning, that means an inward agitation that's meant to try one's faith to the point of overthrow. Let me say that again. An inward agitation that's meant to try one's faith to the verge of overthrow. Jesus is saying, Peter, that's how Satan wants to sift you. He wants to shake you up so hard and so bad that you feel like your faith is just gonna be overcome, overthrown, and your faith is gonna feel more like chaff than it does wheat. But Peter, in my hands, it's a sifting, it's a refining. But here in this passage, we see him say that he wants to prepare Peter for the sifting. Here's something really interesting also in the Greek language there. So when it says, listen, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, the you there in that language is plural. So he's talking to Peter on the rock on whom he's gonna build the church and he says, Peter, listen, Satan, he's not taking, it. all of you are gonna get sifted like wheat. There aren't going to be exemptions. You know, like you can get an exemption for something or a note to get out of gym class when you're young. He's saying there are no exemptions. Satan has desired to sift all of you, my followers. If you follow Jesus, you're going to go through a sifting. And some of you are going through a sifting right now. It may be financial, it may be relational, or maybe a marriage or a child that's kind of going off the rails. And you feel that shaking that is sent right from the pit of hell to agitate you to the point that your faith can feel like it's gonna be overthrown. But in the middle of that, there's an encouragement in Jesus's next part. So he says, listen, Simon, Satan wants to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith won't fail. And Jesus does something interesting here in the language. He switches the you from plural, Satan desires to sift all of you, to singular, but I prayed for you, Chloe, and I prayed for you, John, 
and I've prayed for you, Mary. Don't you love that in the middle of the sifting that we all go through, sometimes when you think like, how does God keep the whole world and all of our problems going? And no, you know, some of you are like, I have four kids, I can't even remember their names sometimes. How does he keep track of everything that we're going through? He knows that we will all be sifted, but he is praying for you specifically. We don't just have a savior, we have an intercessor. And he is praying for us, he is praying for you. I wish that if there's one thing that you take away from this is that you know how much he cares for you, how much he sees you, how valuable your story is, and how your pain touches his heart. And he doesn't just say, oh yeah, I wish I could do something about that. He is a God who can do something about that. And what he does in the midst of it is pray for you that your faith would not fail. He wasn't praying for Simon to be saved from the sifting, oh, it'll be done soon, or that the sifting would end quickly, although we'd love that, right? If the Lord's like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that you were going to go through a bankruptcy. Well, let's just, oh oh my gosh, that was a clerical error. He said, no, you're going to go through tough times and tough things, but I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail. There's a time uh, a few years back, I did a a one-year trauma chaplaincy program at a large hospital, and I got a call to come and to come to this girl's room. She didn't ask for me, but the nurse said, I think she needs your visit. She's about 22, 23 years old, pregnant with twins, and about 24 weeks along, and one of the twins had died. And that particular day when the nurse said, come and visit her, it was her stepdad's funeral because he had committed suicide. And because she was on bed rest, she couldn't go. And so she said, she's a little forlorn, come and talk to her. And so as I came in the room, she was polite, but she had the curtains drawn and the lights off. And she just laid there. She she said good morning or hello, but she didn't really want to talk. And so she just rubbed her stomach a little bit. And I said, I'm going to take a chance here. And I asked her, do you know what you're having and have you named them? And she turned and looked at me and she nodded and she rubbed her belly and she said, faith is dead, but hope is still alive. Faith is dead, but hope is still alive. And I think Jesus prays that Peter's faith won't fail because for a lot of us, you might be here today and be like, my faith is dead. I counted on it. Didn't feel like it was there when I, when I needed it. It's not working for me. It hasn't been the magic beans that changed everything. In this moment, when you feel that, Jesus is praying for you that your faith will not fail. You don't need to fear what's ahead. It's great if Pastor Ryan prays for you and Pastor Rachel, and I know that they do. It's great if I pray for you at the end of service, but do you know that you have the God of all heaven and earth praying for you? Come on, best prayer partner ever, right? And what is his prayer? Not that the sifting will end quick, but because the devil is at work in this world. But he's praying that in the midst of what you're going through, that your faith would be sustained. And we can see that he's working out a good plan. Let's look at the next part of this verse. So he says, listen, Simon, Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you specifically that your faith won't fail. And then he says this, and when, not if you turn back, when you turn back, that you'll strengthen the hearts of your brothers and sisters. So in the corporate sifting, Jesus is interceding for us that our faith won't fail. And Jesus knew that Peter was about to blow it, that the rooster would crow three times and he would, he would realize, I'm not the center of this story. In fact, I'm the very worst character in this story. And he tells him in the middle of that, you're going to turn back. You're going to come back. And when you do, you're going to have such a testimony that it's going to be able to help strengthen and encourage your brothers and sisters. Any people here with a testimony this morning that God has brought you through, that you should not be standing, that the doctors have said you shouldn't be here today, that you're with a spouse or a family member, that you don't know how it's stayed together and worked, but God brought you here to this house together It's amazing the testimonies, the things that God has done. Um, The word there for strengthen, it means to fix something and to make it hold tight. 
If you ever buy like a dresser or a bookshelf from Ikea and they give you those extra bolts, <laughs> right? So that you can bolt it to the back of the, the wall so that if something is heavy or a child climbs on it, it doesn't fall over. He's saying there that I'm gonna strengthen you and you now are gonna strengthen the hearts of your brothers. You are gonna help come and be like that bolt that will bolt them into that stud and it will be immovable and it will be unshakable and it won't topple over when they're going through a shaking. It will be held fast. He said that our testimony will be a strength to our brothers and sisters. When we turn back to him, he will strengthen them through us. A few years back, I was struggling um, in the ministry. So for the pastors, here's, here's your pastor's appreciation moment. It was hard. It was really hard. And I remember getting to probably the toughest toughest window of my pastoring career. And at the time where it felt the worst and I was being shaken the most, I was offered the chance to go away for a month to a sabbatical for pastors up in, in the mountains of Tennessee. And at the time I was in Connecticut. It was like a 12, 13, 14 hour drive. And the first thing I was like, oh, I don't know if I should go. I should stay here because we're in the middle of some, some challenges and struggles. I shouldn't leave. And then everything in me said, you need to let go and let God and just say, God, you're on the throne there. But it was hard, right? We can, it can be a bumper sticker real easy, but a life, a life kind of lesson, it takes us a while. So when I got to the retreat, I felt like I was duped and hoodwinked because there was no internet, no TV, no cell phone reception. And they said, by the way, we've put a can of bear spray in your cabin. So you know what kind of place I was at. So my best friend came with me at the time, so it was nice, I wasn't alone and isolated. And because we had nothing else to do, we, would, we started to do this thing every day. This was our entertainment. We picked apples out of a tree. We drove up the mountain, we're in the middle of the mountains, about a mile or so, and there was a herd of cows and we would feed the cows apples every day. And that was, that was our entertainment, that was everything. And so um, one day, about two or three weeks into this, we had been warned, like, you can go up where the apples are, but don't go much further because it starts to get real backward, backwoods, like people making whiskey in bathtubs on their porch, right? Coming out with shotguns if they see somebody not from here. And so we were told not to go up too far. So this one day when we, we came up the mountain, two big bags of chopped apples, and we called those cows and they would not come to us. And we called and called and called. And we're, my friend said, maybe we need to use a southern accent since they're southern cows. And they, would just, they just wouldn't come. For two weeks, they, they would run when they saw us, but not today. And so I said, maybe we should go up the road a little bit more. And my friend said, are you sure? Should we do this? And, and I said, let's, let's try. Well, we were going and going and there was houses fewer and fewer and fewer. And then the road stopped at like a logging camp and we had to turn around in someone's driveway. And my friend said, turn around quick. Let's get out of here quick. Well, the owner of the house saw us. They don't see cars. They came out and said, come here, what are you doing here? And she said, oh, here it comes. We're getting killed. <laughs> She's a very positive person. And... But the woman was really nice, and we said we were trying to feed you know, these cows, and, and there were, they wouldn't eat today. And she said, well, I got, I got to feel the goats over here in my pen. Do you want to come feed the goats? They'd love your apples. So we did what you do when you're just sitting around feeding goats with strangers. <laughs> we started to talk about, well, where are you from? She said, I see you know, your Connecticut play, like, and all of this. And, and finally, I said, well, I was raised in Pennsylvania. She said, oh, my, my husband's uncle used to live there many years ago. And oh, what town? Oh, the Northeast. Oh, well, him too. And, and it was this little town called Berwick, a very small town. And she said, I think that's where he lived. And so her husband came out and she said, honey, didn't your husband live in Berwick? And he said, yeah, like, you know, 30 years ago. And I said, what was his name? She said, oh, you wouldn't know him. It was so long. And as he turned to walk away, I heard him say under his breath, he was always upset about that church and, you know, how that church failed. And I said, I'm sorry, did you, you said he was a pastor? I said, who was your uncle? It was the man that led my parents to the Lord in the 70s and that started a Christian school where at five years old, I wrote something that my mom framed for me that says, God's called me to be a missionary. That's called me into the ministry. And I put my head down on, on the railing of that fence and I wept. Sprint couldn't find me there. Sprint can't find me anywhere. <laughs> Nobody 
nobody had access to us there. And what struck me is that God knew exactly where I was. In the middle of my pastoral hurt and pain, in the middle of my sifting season, God knew where I was. And as I drove off the mountain, we sang the song about God reigning and his kingdom being powerful. Guys, it hit me. We serve a God who is so powerful, he can make cows not hungry on day 14 (laughs) so that I go up the road and I meet who I need to meet. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he can make them hungry and not hungry. He reigns. He is powerful. And when I came home, I said, Lord, if you know where I am and you see where I am, I can trust you and I can trust you with my life and with this church. And that has been a testimony from my life for our pastors here, for my friends that I've been encouraging in the Lord. When you have a testimony, you will strengthen the hearts of your brothers and your sisters. This church is filled with testimonies. We're supposed to have our minds fixed on him. Tell everyone how he held you fast. So friends, in the same way that the enemy has a twofold purpose for sifting our life, the first one is to keep you from Jesus, from experiencing his beauty, from knowing his heart. He wants to keep you from thinking that God is good. Because if he can get you to question that, Oh man, he feels like he's got a foothold. He also wants to distract you, that if you do walk with the Lord, he wants to discourage you so much that you maybe stop pursuing the things of God or stop stepping out and and obeying God in the things that he's calling you to do. He wants to keep you from experiencing Jesus and distract you from serving Jesus. Calvary Church, Satan has desired to sift you, to sift us like wheat. And he will use anything he can to do the sifting. A job, a relationship, an in-law. Good. There were no amens. The amens on that one would have been very dangerous. And you're sifting. I don't know what it is, but I do know that you've either been sifted and you're coming out of a sifting or you're heading into one because Jesus said that Satan wants to sift all of us. But Calvary Church, Jesus is praying for you. Each one of you, by name, by need, by personality type, he knows you and he is praying for you. And his prayer is not that your sifting would end. His prayer is that in the middle of the sifting, your faith won't fail. And that when you come out of this, you're going to be able to strengthen a lot of people. When you come out of it. Remember I told you there are two translations for sifting. One was what the enemy tries to do, that agitating till your faith is gone. The second one is to sift, to refine. And Jesus says, that's what I want. The enemy wants to sift you so that your faith is shaken. I'm sifting you so that you're going to come out refined like gold in the fire. It's really important for us when we're going through a sifting season to not isolate ourselves. Right? You ever get, you feel like you're being shaken and the enemy is really at work in your life so you don't want to come to church. You stop answering phone calls from, from people who you know, might pray for you. You just, you put on that Christian fake, yeah, I know everything's good, praise God, bless up, right? <laughs> but together is very important. That's why we come to church. That's why we have small groups. That's why we're the body of Christ. So Jen and Aaron, you're here. You may remember this. Back in the early 90s when we were at Valley Forge, A skunk ran under the girls' dorm and sprayed. And because our floors were old and had a lot of cracks in them, that smell came up and saturated all of the girls that lived on my floor. So we'd go to the cafeteria and we would be told that we smelled like skunks and that we stunk and it was horrible, you know, as young people. But within a week or so, you know, washing our clothes, it started to fade. But if if we would come together and sit together in chapel as a group or in a class as a group or the cafeteria as a group, when we all got together, that smell combined again and and it came alive. It had a resurrection. It was resurrection power when we were together. (laughs) But that's what church is supposed to be. That when you and I are feeling our faith fade, we're being sifted so bad and so hard and it hurts and we don't want anybody to touch it We don't want to come near anyone. So when we come together, 
You may have weakened faith and your faith might be shaky right now and your faith may be struggling, but when we come together, the power of God, the Holy Spirit comes in and that resurrection power takes that little bit of faith. Your faith may be dead, but hope is still alive, that he is alive and well and working in your life and my life and in the life of this church. I'd like to just take a moment as we close, if you can bow your heads for just a moment. We're talking a lot about sifting today and how the enemy wants to sift us. But scripture says that there's another sifting of wheat that happens. That when we stand before the Lord, when we come before him at the end of our life, at the time of judgment, that there is a separating that happens. The wheat those who follow Jesus from the chaff, those who don't know him. And when the wheat remains, as the chaff is thrown into the fire, it's, it's discarded. If you don't know Jesus and you're shaken, you're, you're not the wheat, you're the chaff. But he wants you. He loves you. His heart is that none of us are separated from him for eternity. And so if you're here today and you say, man, Melissa, I'm going through a shaking, but I don't have hope or faith. This is your chance to say, you know what? I want to put my hope in Jesus. I haven't trusted him with my life yet, but I want to turn my life over to him. If that's you and you have not said, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want your life in me. This can be a great morning to do it. Would you just slip a hand up so I know to pray for you? Say, Jesus, I want you to come and take over this messy life of mine. I put it in your hands. I want to be your follower. And hear me when I say this doesn't promise that you're going to have a perfect life without being shaken. No, this passage tells us we're still going to be shaken. But you will know that there's one in the fire with you. You will know that there's someone who is praying for you, encouraging you, and will never leave you or forsake you. Father, we thank you for those who've lifted hands today. Lord, they're walking into a new season of life. There's a line, the scripture says, we pass from death to life. We ask, Father, that you would come and fill these new brothers and sisters who desire to follow you with your life, that the blood that was shed at Calvary came for their sins, their sicknesses, their shame. And Lord, they can stand in you that when trouble times come and before it may have made their knees buckle, but now it makes them hit their knees and just say, Jesus, I need your help, come. And we thank you, Lord, that they can have a savior who's also praying for them. And secondly, Calvary Church, some of you who are here or online today would say, I am in a season of being sifted. You don't know me, but my marriage, my health, my finances, my business, my education, my friendships, my car, it's all being sifted. Remember Jesus' words to Peter, listen, it's gonna get tough, but let me tell you how we're gonna get through this. You are not alone, I am with you. And this process is not gonna destroy you, it's gonna refine you. And the sifting that the enemy meant for evil, I am praying for you and it will turn to good. If you're being sifted right now in any way of your life and you're like, I, you may not even have known what that feeling is and didn't have a word for it and you're like, yeah, I think that word is sifted. I'm being shaken right now. The enemy is coming at me. Would you just stand so that we can pray? If you're like, Melissa, I'm sifted. I'm in a sifted season. Just as an act of surrender and worship to him, would you just say, here I am, Lord all over this place, all over this place. He said all of us would be sifted, but he is praying for you, for your kid, for your marriage, for your financial bill that's coming up and you don't know how it's gonna get paid. But mostly he's praying for your faith, that through this you would not have your faith fail, but that you would be strengthened by him you may not be able to hold on to faith, but you're the one who is faithful holds on to you. And you're gonna be such a testimony on the other side of this. 
I love this morning while we were singing, our, our sister who's translating um, in sign language in ASL, she, I, I was watching as she translated the line, surrender. Can you do that for me for one more time? <laughs> surrender. Lord, Lord, we surrender. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. We surrender to you. All of our brokenness, all of our hardship, all of our pain. Lord, sometimes it catches us by surprise. It doesn't catch you by surprise. You, you said in your word that it would happen. But you also said that you would overcome and that we would overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimonies that when we speak it can strengthen our brothers and sisters. Father, I pray for those who are here today who feel like they're just at the edge of their rope and everything just seems to be coming apart. But Lord, in your eyes, it's just coming together. Lord, we might feel like our faith is dead, but there's that little glimmer of hope and it's not much, but we offer it to you today. Would you fan it with the flame of your Holy Spirit and bring our faith back to life? Lord, we thank you for your love that brings us back to life. Lord, whatever it takes to bring you glory, we offer it to you. In the midst of our sifting, we lift up a, a praise to you. We ask you to come inhabit our praise. We don't ask that you get us out of that situation. Lord, we ask that you get in that situation with us and show us what it looks like when you're standing in the middle of that hardship. Teach us, Lord, what it looks like to stand in faith in the middle of our sifting. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, church.